She Can We Tell Women's Stories. We show how women got to where they are today and we connect with each other through these stories that inspire, motivate and mentor. And I'm really excited to talk to Katrina Johnston Zimmerman today. Katrina, welcome to She Can. I have never spoken to someone who does what you do, so it's even more exciting. You're an American urban anthropologist, lecturer and advocate of heart-centered cities. You're part of the BBC 100 Most Inspiring Women. You advocate for women and girls in our urban environments. You're the founder and director of Think.Urban, which is an urban consulting company specializing in research and analysis of behavior in public spaces. You're an expert in pattern recognition through the lens of anthropology of human behavior in cities. So tell us a little bit more about what you do and how you got there, Katrina. When did you realize I'm really interested in that? Wow, yes, thank you. And thank you so much for having me. Um, when did I first uh, realize I was interested in that? So it's funny um, if you're watching this on the video, you can see I have like a painting in my background and I actually started in fine art. So um, strangely, I was uh, sort of a, a wild child in the woods, you know, kind of loved animals, um, loved to draw and paint and just spent hours in the basement. Um, and I don't know, I was just always interested in humans and how they work. Um, I guess maybe I could have been like a surgeon, but <laughs> uh, basically I took it to art, art history and then finally focused on culture. Um, and I think that kind of that kind of cultural curiosity is what always gets me. So I didn't grow up in cities. And when I got to a city, it was just it was just an explosion of amazing opportunities about um, who we are, why we do what we do, um, you know, how we're feeling. And I realized there was an opportunity to make it better, basically. Katrina, so tell us a little bit more about the work that you're doing. Um, so we understand what that means. Yes, that um, I actually I, I will say I have a secret. I love calling myself an urban anthropologist in part just to get people to ask that question, um, because I think it's sort of a it's also an advocacy angle. Right. Um, yeah. You know, so you live in a city, I'm assuming, or yeah. obviously interact with one regularly, as do most human beings on the planet. But most of us don't have any understanding of what a city actually is and how it operates. And we certainly don't understand what cities used to be, right? And how we got to now. It's not like built into our education, you know? You just wake up and you go, okay, you get a driver's license at like 16. You, you know, have to get a job somewhere downtown in a central business district. You know, you get an apartment, whatever. So, you know, really kind of teasing that out and advocating for looking more closely and critically at cities is a, a clear part of what I also do in my daily life. So an urban anthropologist is sort of, can you take all of those things together? Can you think of it as like a system of systems? Can we look at a city more like an actual habitat that we have created and occupy mm -hmm. and share with each other, right? Um, and then how can we sort of like turn that inside out and better understand how we impact that and how it can be a better situation for everyone? So that observation of an anthropological lens um, is essentially doing the analysis to showcase, you know, okay, this place can be better in these ways because we witness people doing these things or we talk to people and understand these needs, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Katrina, so give us a real life example. So you will go into work at think.urban. So what, who are your clients and how does that work? So I have consulted and been an advocate and a keynote speaker um, the entirety of my career, but I've also worked in different capacities. So at times I've worked as an employee at, you know, say for instance, a research lab um, at a university. Um, I've also worked for the city of Philadelphia as a fellow, kind of like an internal consultant, mm -hmm. trying to tease out those systems and understand best practices and bring them into the city in particular where I live. Um, and I've also worked for more uh, design agencies doing like active observation and 
what some people call user experience essentially within the yeah. built environment for different capacities like wayfinding um public spaces and nonprofit organization uh things like that so when i'm doing my own consulting i'm attaching myself to a project and really again just sort of boosting that element of analysis ahead of time in a different way than is not standard on projects so if you're an architect or an urban planner you're actually not you know guaranteed that your project is going to be on the ground look at things ahead of of time talk to people ahead of time really again tease that all out and especially not go back afterwards and then assess how good you did on your project and what can be you know changed a little bit it's all an iterative process so i'm here to help that along okay katrina so what would you say is your main motivator with um all these different hats you're wearing oh gosh um <laughs> i would say Honestly, I think I'm just always trying to seek to improve something. Um, I think that it it's almost a kind of madness, you know, when you understand that there is a solution to a problem, but yeah. that we're not doing it. Because the thing about humans is, and our cities and everything around you, you know, everything in my house, everything in your house, everything on the street is we designed everything. You know, cities used to be way different. They, they were much smaller. Obviously, we had less people. Um, the earliest ones were really more gender equitable as an example, right? And so if we can understand that we have this potential, because we can do anything, we can make any, we can remake all of this to reflect whatever it is that we want. So the future is completely open. So like that drive, I think on the ground is just to constantly strive towards like that, at least potential ideal even if we don't necessarily hit the mark. Hmm. I love that. I mean, it seems to me as if you are a real visionary dreamer, but at the same time, you have all the data and analysis to then underpin those things. So I'm interested, Katrina, what do you think are your top qualities that serve you every day in what you do? Um, definitely curiosity. Um, I would say I, I'm also an adjunct professor. Um, uh, currently at Drexel University, and I teach urban strategy master's students. And that's a multidisciplinary degree. I also teach architects and interior students. And, you know, I think that bizarrely, I don't know why this again, I just sort of like what? Um, curiosity isn't like built into the system for some educational programs. And what you're supposed to do is really tease out like, why did we get there? You know, um, how could it be better? Um, how do you also like feel about that? What can you do about it? Um, that is also curiosity. Um, and I think hope absolutely is another key component. Um, I don't know where I get that from. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. It's just sort of, I think, I think some things are definitely just built into your DNA. Um, but I have to, I think, I mean, it's also a choice, but I think that that kind of optimism about our potential is necessary um, because otherwise you're just in a constant existential crisis um, about who we are as humans on this planet. I mean, there's a lot of turmoil, there's a lot of pain and it doesn't have to be that way. So I think the more we can change culture in that sense and continue to fight against that cynicism, it's um, it's necessary for our survival. So it's in me, but also it it is a choice that I make all the time that That's I hope. Intention, to. yeah, yeah. And Katrina, I'm so happy that you say that because really we need to apply that to everything. The world we live in right now, I think, if we continue with the cynicism and the sort of acceptance of the status quo all of our young people will not participate anymore in the systems that we've built to make us as a society function. Yes. Katrina, so what tips or how can we make urban spaces more inclusive of women and girls? What is your vision? This, it is very hard. I think also that's why having uh, optimism towards any kind of change is so important too, because we have been embedded in a system of essentially patriarchal cities for about four to 5,000 years. Um, that's not a lot of time in the scale of humanity though. So if you, if you sort of zoom out 
and think of us on this collective timeline as a species on this planet, it's hundreds of thousands of years. And we only started settling down less than 10,000 years ago. So we're very new. We're babies, you know, we're urban babies. <laughs> um, and in a lot of ways, we're kind of human babies because we're sort of relearning and, and, and you know, figuring it out again. Um, and that's a lot of vulnerability. So there's that. Um, but also, you know, it, the cities are very complicated. And so we do have a lot of work to do to get sort of back in a way to this better system that we must have had in the past based on our own sort of intrinsic understanding of humanity because mm. we, we made cities from scratch you know we made them based on us we made society based on us and we made it really lovely at first you know like we understood how to take care of each other and ourselves and the planet and so that's sort of what we've lost in some capacity so we have to tease out not only the actual buildings and the structure and the streets and those systems um, but also who we are and where we fit uh, in a community, right? Like we don't have, I don't, I don't know about your community, if you feel very strongly about it. Thankfully, I live in a really lovely human scale, walkable community in Philadelphia. I'm very lucky, um, but everybody should be afforded that, right? That's the whole yeah. point. And everybody can have that is the other point, right? Yeah. So in terms of tips and ways that we can all do this, um, we also have to remember that we all make the city every day. It's just yeah. like how you make culture every day, you know, even just by showing, showing somebody some kind of courtesy, right? You're changing the understanding of, again, who we are in relation to each other. So when you're also changing the environment, maybe you're putting, you know, a bench outside, you know, and you use it and other people can use it. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you're just putting a sign in your window that talks about that hope or something along those lines that shows tolerance and acceptance and, you know, progressive values, just something that really uplifts somebody's life. Um, that changes, that changes that person. Um, I will never forget the day when I was in Bristol and I was walking along the harbor and I found, I've, thousands of photos of different things like this in cities everywhere. But I found this chalk sketch that somebody had put on the side of like a utility box um, that just said, you are loved with a little heart, you know? Mm. I don't know who that person was. I'll never, unless they watch this, I'll never know who that person was. <laughs> what year was that? I don't know. Um, but, you know, they also will never know how that impacted someone else, right? Like they'll never know that that made me stop in my tracks and just changed my outlook on that day. I needed that in that moment. And so the more that we understand that we all need each other to that extent, like that's like crucial. So as you move through a city, even if you're not an urbanist, so you don't have to be an urbanist, like we're all urbanists because we're all in this together. You can make a huge difference just by having that kind of optimism and that positivity in the situation and then work to change what isn't actually working. So you can get involved um, you know, in your local government systems, obviously that's a system we have to work in. Um, you can, again, show neighbors and other strangers support in a lot of different ways. Um, and if you are involved or you do have a position of power, you can ensure that there is a diversity of opinions and impact and input in that situation, whatever that might be. So look around the room and say, okay, who's here? Who's not here? Right. Say, what are we thinking of? What are we missing? Are we taking into account, you know, young girls in a, in this place or in this program? Um, you know, are we taking into account elderly women? Are we talking about people in a wheelchair, talking about people on a skateboard? You know, there are so many different ways that we exist as humans that we have left out of the equation with focusing on just that male centered city perspective. That's really the crux of it. There's not been enough input for a diversity of positive output. And that's what needs to really shift in order to change this equation. Yeah, absolutely, Katrina. So um, how does safety come into all of this? I mean, I think that the one thing that I always feel every woman I interview, I don't think a single one feels safe in our cities by themselves. How, how much does that play a role? So. 
this is absolutely the thing I get asked all the time. Um, and everybody wants to talk about if there was a city that was made by and for women, what that would look like. And the first thing people think about is lighting, you know, like just lighting, you know, street safety, um, in that sense, walking alone um, at night and how to make that safer. Um, the thing is the truth, the secret is that lighting is not enough. You know, just making something bright doesn't actually necessarily decrease, you know, the danger uh, aspect of a place. Cities are actually just a proxy for society. So if you're thinking about lighting as a solution, mm. that's not a solution to the root cause. The yeah. root cause of the situation is sexism and misogyny and our society and our culture against women in that way. So lighting is a Band-Aid solution. It is definitely something that you can do, but what's even better is having lots of people. What's even better is building a community that looks out for each other, right? Mm -hmm. What's even better is educating young boys that this is not an acceptable way to move through the world. And what's even better is putting women in positions of power and leadership that allow girls to grow up feeling already strong and inspired, like anything is possible. That's the difference between a societal shift and just something like a design solution that is just not actually going to make that much of a difference. Yeah, thank you, Katrina. I think that sums it up really perfectly and beautifully. Katrina, so what are you most proud of to date? Oh my gosh, that's such a hard question. <laughs> oh, um, I don't know because <laughs> to be perfectly honest, I sometimes forget the things that I have done um <laughs> like because I'm, so many of us right like I'm just you know you're so co you're constantly just like turning it over and working on the next thing um I'll say I'll say two I'll, I'll answer mm, okay can I answer three things Definitely. <laughs> okay so firstly I am most proud of my teaching um, and I think that's because it took me a while to get to teaching. I, I got a master's degree in urban studies, and then I sort of stopped because I wanted to get out into the real world. Um, but I found my way back to the classroom, which was a natural fit. And I feel really comfortable. And I just love my students. I've done thesis advising and things like that, too. So I just I really love inspiring and encouraging people and giving them my knowledge. So passing that on. Um and I hope to do more of that in the future. I'm looking more towards settling in an academic institution as one of my next steps. Um, so fingers crossed, I really feel passionate about that. That's my first one. Secondly, um, I am most proud of saying yes to things um, that are very scary. Uh, you know, and I could say something like an achievement or something like that, but really just, you know, every talk I've given, I've been asked to give. You know, so this is something where people reach out to me. You reached out to me. I say yes to everything because I kind of have to, you know, sort of pushing yourself forward and saying, yeah, I can do that. I can do that. You have to constantly reassure yourself. And the biggest yes that I ever made was um, the Senate of Chile invited me to a conference that is a futures conference every year they put on called Congreso Futuro. And they um, invited me to Santiago, but as a part of the trip, also added a sort of tour, you know, of the country, obviously, because it's, you know, a, a governmental conference. And that included a day trip to Antarctica. Wow. So I did not see that coming. Obviously, I don't say yes to these things in order to, you know, travel to far off locations and have a grand old time. But we really got wine and dined, you know, <laughs> they did a great job. And they put us on a military plane at three in the morning to <laughs> fly over to a continent that I never in my lifetime thought I was going to visit. Hmm. And I got that email that said, would you like to be included on this Antarctica trip? And, you know, if you, if you stop for a minute, sometimes all of us, you know, get the, the flood of that fear, right? You know, what if, what if the plane goes down? Like what, what if, you know, like, oh, I don't, I don't know. Like, can, am I capable of that? Um, and you have to say yes to sort of push yourself forward in that way. Um, and I'll never forget. I said yes. And I just jumped up and, and like, just jumped around my room was just like, oh my God, I'm going to Antarctica. 
Um, and I am so proud to this day that I didn't turn that. I never, I couldn't have looked at myself in the mirror if I had said no. And it was very like sort of nerve wracking of a trip, but it was absolutely um, once in a lifetime. And I'm very proud of myself. And then the third one I'll leave open because uh, I don't know what else I'm capable of, you know, and I'm, I'm just proud of uh, the fact that I'm willing to move forward in that way. And so I think that the third one is um, yet to be determined. Yeah. Amazing, Katrina. I love that. Thank you so much. So what are your plans and goals? You've alluded to it. You, you might go sort of more full time into academia. What are your goals and dreams for the next years? Um, I would love to write a book. Haven't done it yet. Um, mostly because I'm, I'm constantly sort of writing things in my head and if it's not sort of there yet, you know, like the there isn't there. Um, so that's still in formation. Um, but I would love to write a book that is accessible. So I want to write one that allows, um, everyone to read it. I mean, this isn't, I have a whole, I also have a bookshelf behind me with a ton, every single city book I have, I have, and have basically read and they're all so isolated. And if they're not isolated, then they're economic, you know, yeah. and, and that is a whole separate audience, you know, New York Times bestseller economic cities, we get it, we get it, you know, but how can we actually bring it down to that human element and educate everyone in the same way that I try to educate students in the classroom or at a keynote. So want to write an accessible book and I would love to do an upgraded on the street uh, observational analysis of behavior, a proper one, more than what I just do every day walking around mm -hmm. um, or as a consulting project in a very limited area. Um, there was a very famous study that was done that changed the world. Most people don't know about this, but uh, William H. Holly White, you probably heard of Jane Jacobs, who was his contemporary as well. They both, with their essentially anthropological analysis, um, changed the way that we make public spaces. You know, obviously, Italy and other places had movable chairs and France and everything in Paris, you know, we love those places, but the United States and other Western contexts just hadn't, they hadn't had those. Um, so that set off a chain reaction to say, oh, we have to really think about people using these places and what they need. They need a food stand and movable chairs and some water and music or something like that. And it really just took off. So that's standard now because of the work they did in the fifties and sixties. So that was a very different time. You know, women weren't part of the workforce as much or in public spaces as much. We weren't thinking as much about children and other people in that way. Far more diversified in different places and cities are bigger. So how do we, you know, upgrade that? You know, let's let's do let's have a different perspective on that analysis um, in a thorough research capacity and then see what comes of that. And maybe that's uh, how the book emerges um, but that's just been a passion of mine the entire time. I'll, I'm always sad that I never met either of them, um, but they're my my absentee mentors. And uh, I really, I'm always, they're just the gold standard. <laughs> Katrina, it sounds so interesting. It gives me goosies immediately because I can immediately feel, wow, there is something there. And, you know, I've never, ever had anyone talk to me in a way where I thought, um, someone really thought about our public spaces or even our own spaces, but in a coherent way with all the challenges we face as, you know, having to be more inclusive, having to include women, having to think about climate change and the environment and what that all means for the spaces that we're all in that have essentially been designed for not all of us, right? And not given all the challenges that we face today. So I really can't wait for that. That, Katrina and what a beautiful finish is this uh, that that we leave you with this really big project to do and no we, big deal yeah no <laughs> big deal you gotta just get to it yeah thank I'll you so it. much Katrina for talking to me today and for telling your story thank you so much this was wonderful